One of the most poorly titled movies of all time, The First Purge, invalidated five years of me referring to this movie as The First Purge. However, unlike the original Purge, this one came out relatively close to when the story takes place. The movie is set in 2016. If you want to see me explain the entire timeline, watch this video. But being set closer to the release date affords this movie an interesting opportunity to incorporate current events for the first time. Like how Isaiah has a poster for another poorly titled movie, Halloween 2018, in his room. This is part advertising for Blumhouse, who wanted to hype up their other big release for that year, and part foreshadowing, as Isaiah and his loved ones would hide in a closet at the end of the movie, just like Laurie Strode did in Halloween. To learn about the other references and hidden meanings in the first purge, stick around to the end of this video. There aren't really any decent masks for sale for the first purge for whatever reason, so I'm gonna go bare for this one. Welcome to Things You Missed. The initial three purge films were both written and directed by James DeMonico, but for this prequel, he'd stay on as screenwriter while tasking Gerard McMurray with directing duties. Subtle is probably not the word best used to describe any purge film, but you could at least make the argument that the themes are subtle in one through three, especially if you've seen my videos analyzing them. McMurray decided to take a more direct approach. The poster for this movie and the lines said during this scene are very obvious jabs at the United States White House administration during the time this movie was made, whereas the previous movies depicted the NFFA as an alternate to real-life political parties. As you know, we're not here to talk about the obvious details in this movie, we're here to talk about the things you missed. So let's get in to the things you missed. Here's the things you missed screen. One detail I found interesting was how the NFFA chief of staff intentionally sends his mercenaries to purge in low-income areas. This makes it appear as if the lower class is out for blood, which almost directly leads into the beginning of the original movie, where a group of affluent purgers hunt down an innocent homeless man for no reason other than the fact that he's homeless. We've also seen that the NFFA likes to use statistics to make it seem like the purge is helping reduce crime during the rest of the year. Unfortunately, the NFFA website, which was updated with statistics and additional lore to promote the purge movie releases in the past, has its weakest iteration for the first purge. There's basically no new information here. But perhaps more importantly, at the beginning of this movie, we see how this data was skewed. The scene suggests that they're doing their research about crime behavior using crazies and addicts, as opposed to the general population. This is a tactic that they use to craft their own narrative. They want to make it seem like the purge is the answer for the nation's problems, but many of their opposers see through the BS and protest at the sign-up stations, where citizens can volunteer to participate in the purge experiment in exchange for financial compensation. The conflict draws in many news stations, including one called called KRXJ News, a station that has appeared in the TV show Psych and in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. It seems it's appeared in a couple of other shows as well. Is this a coincidence? I don't think so. There are about 35,000 possible combinations that start with either K or W. I tried googling a number of random combinations, and surprisingly they all seem to be taken. But KRXJ was the only one I found that yielded a fictional entity. After doing a little digging, I realized that prop designer Daniel Columby has also designed for a few Marvel movies. I'm guessing that's the connection, and the answer to this pointless question. The sign-up stations also give away blue flowers to those who sign up to participate. The TCS, the official flower of the experiment, they represent rebirth. This explains the origin of a through line in each of the Purge movies, which become a sign of support for the Purge. And your blue flowers tell me that you support the Purge. The main antagonist this time is the original NFFA chief of staff, Arlo Sabian. If you've seen my other Purge episodes, you know that Sabian is a name that comes up in every Purge movie, which is perhaps just a symptom of the fact that they're all written by James DeMonico, who likes to have a character named Sabian in all of his work. The other James DeMonico trademark is Staten Island, where the Purge experiment is going to take place. This location appears on a TV screen in the preceding Purge movies, and the two non-Purge movies that he's directed are both set there. But not far from where this is taking place, our main character Dr. Naya leads a protest against the controversial experiment. One of the signs reads, the 28th is a hate crime. This suggests that the purge is being considered as the 28th amendment to the US Constitution, which is confirmed in the original iteration of the website. But I think this movie creates an interesting metaphor for the Constitution. Naya and Isaiah live at a building called the Park Towers. Let's pretend that building is the US Constitution. It's an old building. It has a lot of leaks that have come up over the years. The people that live there have a lot of issues with it. The problem is, the manager is never in, and isn't much help with fixing these issues anyways. Our characters are minorities, and they live on the 14th floor. It just so happens that the 14th Amendment deals with equal protection of the laws, and is often used to fight racial discrimination. This is fitting, because the NFFA hires modern factions of racist groups such as the KKK and Aryan Nations to go into Staten Island and purge. The main bad guy, whose name is... 
General Smiley <laughs> has a gold armband, very similar to the red Nazi armband you might see generals wearing in old photographs. They attack the entire building, floor by floor. On the second floor, a couple of armed citizens fight back against them. As it turns out, the Second Amendment is the rights to bear arms, something citizens are reminded of in the form of a huge billboard. The text at the bottom says, paid for by UARO Political Victory Fund. I have no idea what UARO is, but if you look up Political Victory Fund, you'll find a bunch of stuff about the NRA, who are stated at the beginning of the movie to be supporting the New Founding Fathers. The New Founding Fathers rising in polls with the NRA now endorsing them and supporting them financially with large donations to the NFFA war chest. The implication is that the purge is fueled by money. This whole thing happened because the NFFA values money more than it values the lives of its citizens. They have monetized and incentivized murder. <laughs> The police officers who are keeping an eye on this protest don't seem too enthused, but with names like Forbes and Sachs, maybe it's because they are in on it as well. Staten Island was chosen as the site of the experiment partially because it was home to a number of street gangs, one of which was led by a man named Dimitri who surprisingly operates out of a community center named after Jamaican activist Marcus Garvey. You've probably noticed that this movie picks up where election year left off, comparing the anti-purge movement to the American civil rights movement. The first purge is, as usual, a lot less subtle about it. There's one point where Naya even claims that she sees the purge as a way that the government is trying to keep minorities down. In election year, Joe's Deli was the center of the community, and it displayed the photos of several civil rights leaders. In the first purge, the community center has some of these same photos. Literally, we see the same exact picture for Martin Luther King Jr. and a very similar picture for Malcolm X. I don't know if this was just the production trying to save a few bucks on props, but it actually makes me wonder if Joe from election year might have been a youngster at this very community center and took these photos with him when he went to DC to start the deli. We know he has been a part of gang activity before. Told you I ain't no saint. Everybody's got a past. The other photos include civil rights figures, Jesse Jackson, Marcus Garvey, and Thurgood Marshall. And the corkboard celebrates athletes who broke the color barrier, like Jesse Owens, Muhammad Ali, and Jackie Robinson. Robinson came up with the Brooklyn Dodgers playing first base, but faced a lot of adversity because he was the first African American to play in MLB as opposed to the Negro Leagues. Brooklyn is right next to Staten Island, and there's a scene later in the film where a black man is purged by white police officers just in front of first base at a stadium with advertisements for the purge experiment displayed in the outfield. So it feels like the movie is telling us that the purge gave bad people the opportunity to undo the progress made by people like Jackie Robinson. And while we're talking about sports, I have to say there was a huge missed opportunity by the wardrobe department. They gave this guy Taz an Eli Manning jersey, but they should have given him number 17 for Plaxico Burris, seeing as how Taz later gets shot in the leg and Plaxico Burris infamously shot himself in the leg at a nightclub. Gotta love the character of Dimitri though. I mean, how many powerful gangsters have time to also be an inspiring community basketball coach? When it comes to gangsters named Dimitri, this guy is probably in my top two or three. In Dimitri's office, he has a giant artwork of Ben Franklin, as seen on the $100 bill. In universe, the reason he has it is simply because he likes money, but there are many shots where the eye peeks through as if it is watching and spying on him. Ben Franklin is one of America's original founding fathers, and in the film, the government is controlled by a party called the New Founding Fathers, and they are notorious for spying on the citizens, whether it be through surveillance cameras, recording contact lenses, or attack drones. Another symbol for this can be seen in the party scene, where a giant eyeball is passed around in the crowd. Partygoers wear animal masks and makeup, such as foxes, lions, leopards, and cows. I think I spotted a wendigo in there too. This is a way of foreshadowing the predator-prey relationship between the NFFA and the public. And speaking of masks, there's a scene where Naya is trapped by a guy in a creepy baby doll mask. The repurposing of a baby doll seems to be a nod to the remote control camera created by Charlie Sandin in the original Purge. Quit playing with Timmy and come help. Since this is a prequel, there are some things that we've come to know about the world of The Purge that seemingly haven't been instituted yet. I noticed that the vehicles have New York license plates, where in later entries, the NFFA have instituted a uniform license plate for the US that says, A Nation Reborn. This was also before the US Postal Service was replaced with NFFA mail. Another difference is that the color of the emergency broadcast screen was red instead of the usual blue. Director Gerard McMurray kind of flipped the script when it comes to color. Other than this one graphic at the very end of election year, the NFFA is always associated 
associated with the color blue. Perhaps the NFFA intentionally chose light blue so that the public associates them with the good guys. Think about pop culture. Good guys blue, bad guys red. But McMurray uses light in this movie to reveal the true allegiances of the characters. In addition to the red emergency broadcast, there's the NFFA headquarters, the hunters that try to purge Isaiah, and Sabian steps into the red light after revealing the true, sinister intentions of the experiment. Isaiah has blue contacts, Nia's church is blue, and Dimitri's car has a blue underglow. Dimitri's office is also blue, but when the assassins enter the room, they come from the lone red light in the corner. The office also has a picture of a man in red boxing against a man in blue. The purge is like a punch in the face from the government to those that oppose them. Interestingly, Skeletor is the only character whose contact lenses are purple, a combination of red and blue. The bystanders who stay home are green, and the looters are usually green and occasionally orange. It's possible that there's also a political side to McMurray's decision to color code. In the US, green is representative of the third party, so maybe that's why green is used to portray those that seem to be neutral. The artwork in Dimitri's office is also representative of the differing ways that Naya and Dimitri deal with their problems. In one scene, Naya confronts him because she was upset that her younger brother was getting involved in his operation. She criticizes him for what his gang has done to their community. As they argue, Dimitri is standing in front of these two boxers. He solves his problems with aggression. The artwork behind Naya also depicts a boxer, but he is sitting in the dark, thinking and quietly reflecting. Naya solves her issues with her head. Isaiah had been hurt while selling illegal substances on the street for Dimitri. Naya is vocally against him doing this, and their apartment is covered with signage that says drug-free zone and no smoking. Dimitri's gangs rule the streets, but the apartment acts as a safe haven for Isaiah. I also noticed that their building looks very similar to the example of low-income housing that Dante Bishop shows on TV during election year. Election year takes place 24 years later, so these images illustrate how nothing ever actually improved while the NFFA was in power. Comparing the technology from the first Purge to election year highlights one of the many frustrating things about the Purge franchise, which is that technology actually seems to get worse as time goes on. Election year has a lot of tech that feels old even today. The coolest gadget in the series is probably the first Purge's video contact lenses, which are actually based on a real concept that Sony has filed patents for. But we're still years and years away from seeing them in practice as I record this video in 2021. Now I'm gonna get to the end of this movie and why it makes no sense, but before I do, it's the part of the video where I've gotta air them out a little bit. During the robbery at this Cash for Gold place, why does the store owner only have a security shade over one window? And I like how he keeps his neon signs on so he can advertise to criminals that he has valuables. Also, there's no way Dimitri would have survived this crash, but he's perfectly fine a couple minutes later. One thing I did find interesting was that the mercenaries that Sabian sent in the purge to give the appearance that people had participated are hidden in everyday vehicles, like a plumber's truck and a veteran transport van. Now, the ending of the movie is a little bit unconventional. With Dimitri's help, Naya, Isaiah, and the others are able to ward off General Smiley, Skeletor, and the rest of the bad guys guys, and the purge ends. Now usually at the end of a movie, you see that the character has changed somehow. We call it the character arc. But when Naya asks Dimitri what's next, he tells her, Now, we fight which kind of goes against the message of the movie, which has basically shown us that fighting basically nearly destroyed the community. So it's kind of like a bad guys win anyway scenario, because conflict is exactly what the NFFA wants. This ending also might be suggesting that Dimitri was kind of like the start of the resistance, a seed that would grow into the anti-NFFA group that we meet later on in the Purge Anarchy as more people in different cities get involved. That group is probably not the most notable resistance in the Purge franchise, though. I would give that honor to the group we see in another poorly titled installment, the Purge TV series. So join me in the next episode of Things You Missed, where I'll be breaking down the entire show. Remember to subscribe to CZ's World for new horrors every week, ring the death bell and select all notifications, and I'll see you in the next one. Assuming we both survive. If you don't want to be purged, stay home. If you go out for essentials, wear a mask.